There we go. I just want to say to all you fathers out there, thank you. Thank you for exemplifying our Lord God to your children and to all the children in your sphere of influence. Thank you for being faithful and living that example before them and uh, just being a blessing and, and being like the Father God, providing for your family, loving your family, caring for your family, and not being afraid to do so in this day and time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then um, Janice. Maybe so. Let the church say amen. Good morning, everybody. I, I stand because I want to honor two men in my life. First, I want to honor my husband as being one of the best fathers to my son. And the reason I know this is because I see it and you live it. I'm trying to get emotional. Thank you for all the seeds that you plant. Thank you for being the head of our household, our protector, provider, and just thank you. And I want this, I, I told you, and I put it on Facebook, but I know you won't go in and look at it. <laughs> 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 so I got to tell you in, in public. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you are a gift to God to step in and be a good father for our son. The second person I want to thank is my pastor. And I'm glad you're sitting down so I can look at you in your face. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to tell you thank you. Before I got married and when I was going to this church for being an example to me of a loving father. I never had a father. And all the men, women that I grew up in church with, they downed men. So, you know, I had a warped sense of what a man was like. I always thought they was this domineering and trash talkers, beer drinkers, and stuff like that. And so, you know, my heart was kind of hardened toward men until I met you, Pastor. Before then, if a man hit me, he had a fight on his hand. I just didn't take it. But coming to this church and seeing you and watching you as a father, as a husband, God began to chip away in my heart and my view began to change about men and about what a man represents, especially when he's following God. Today I can stand and say that bitterness has been removed. It's been placed by love. And I want you to know that you were the very instrument that God used in my life to change that. And I want to thank God that I'm free from those childhood things that held me in bondage. But I want to thank you, Pastor. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being an example to me of what a real man is supposed to be like. Thank you for saying the statement over and over before I got married that you had a staff for anybody to mess with your girls. Even though it was funny, I needed that. You know what that represented to me? Protection that I never had before protection for somebody to watch over me to make sure I was choosing and making right decisions. And I thank you for, I thank you for being that safety net for me. Even though you should have got your staff out and told Jerry to marry me quicker. <laughs> but we finally got the message. And uh, I just want to tell you, I appreciate you. I know you know I love you, but I want you to know it on this Father Day. Thank you for being that example. Thank you for allowing God to use you to show me, a girl who had a warped sense of view, what a man of God and a true man was. And thank you to my husband. Thank you for being a father. Thank you for showing me every day what a father is supposed to be like to a child. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, let's talk about we're walking by faith and not by sight. Looking first of all at 2 Corinthians 5, 9. This is my, and can we turn the air conditioner on over here? It's, it's warm. I mean, put it down on 30. It won't go that low, but I just thought I wish I would talk about it. We do have our lights. I got to get them installed. We, vacation Bible School interrupted. We got more lights we can put out here so that when I get about close to that front row, I don't go into the dark. And um, so we're going to get that done. Hallelujah. If you like climbing ladders, et cetera, and helping hang stuff and see me <coughs> and help you aim light, we got to do that. We got to get that done. All right. Um, we we're talking about walking by faith and not by sight. Our first point was that to be accepted, we must walk by faith. Remember, Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For they that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And one of the things we said about this was when witnessing or ministering to people, it's not your job to convince them that, you know, that, that, to accept Jesus. It is your job to preach the gospel. For they that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. The responsibility is on the person, not you. Your responsibility is to preach the message. Theirs is to believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. You can't, if they resist that, you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't sit there and argue or reason with them. You know, you can't go get the shroud of Turin out and say, hey, here's proof that Jesus was lived, here's his burial cloth. That, that, none of that's important. It's a matter of faith, amen, and not what you see. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Whether, Wherefore we labor, and word that, underline, that, underline that word labor in your Bible. That'll mess up some greasy grace stuff. Whether we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. He said we labor to be accepted of him. Whether present in this earth or absent from this earth, we are, we are laboring, amen, to be accepted of him. And... Um, when on Romans 8, 8, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, so you can't do, it's not by the flesh. Uh, got into two kinds of knowledge, uh, two kinds of faith, that is, sense knowledge, faith. Remember Thomas said, that unless he could see, unless he could take his finger and put it in the palm of his hand and thrust his hand inside, he would not believe. A few days later, Jesus shows up, walks in and says, Thomas, stick your finger in my palm of my hands, thrust your hand in my side, be not faithless, but believing. God, you know, Jesus said, having to have physical evidence is faithlessness. Jesus said demanding physical evidence is faithlessness. He did not commend Thomas for his faith. Are you here? You're going home. Yet the centurion said just speak the word only over in uh, Matthew 8. He said speak the word only, my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled. Now when you look in your Bible, you'll find a couple, two things Jesus marveled at. Faith, the people who didn't have a right to a covenant. And the unbelief of those who did. <laughs> Hello? The Jews had the right to the covenant. Remember, he, he there could do no mighty work. Save so he laid his hand on a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And then what did he do? He went round about their villages teaching. Why? Because the only thing that can combat unbelief is the word of God. Amen. Amen. The way you combat unbelief is the word of God. And so he had to deal with that. And then we talked about the, the comparison between Zacharias and not accepting the angel's report about the baby, uh, John, and about Abraham, who God said, do this, and he packed it up and took off. And we're to have Abraham's faith. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about us having Zacharias' faith or Thomas' faith. David Ingalls even wrote a song. You'll never get Abraham's blessings with the Thomas kind of faith. <laughs> Amen? You'll never get Abraham's blessings with the Thomas kind of faith. The Thomas kind of faith doesn't get the answers. The Thomas kind of faith says, i got to see it to believe it. And let me say this. That's not faith. It is not faith that you have to see to believe. If you have to see it to believe it, then your sense ruled. Your sense knowledge ruled. Amen? The faith that believes is the faith that can take God at his word and act on God's word and not have to, and not have to uh, see it to believe it. So we went on to talk about how the word ruled mine. Uh, always believes God's word. I mean, Believes God's word will free him. The word, not world ruled, the word ruled mind. So you've you got to have your mind renewed to the word of God. Amen? Romans 12, be not conformed to this word. Don't be shaped, fashioned. The Greek word means there. Don't be shaped, fashioned, molded according to this world. 
but be ye transformed. Metamorpho in the Greek. Metamorphosis. Have a metamorphosis of your thinking. Have a transference of your thinking. Think differently. How? By the renewing of your mind. Amen? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You prove out God's will by knowing what the Word says. By having your mind changed, having your mind renewed, having your mind have a metamorphosis through the Word of God, through the washing of the water of the Word, so that you'll think like in line with God's Word. Because I'm going to tell you what, 90% of people's problem is they got thinking, stinking, thinking. And they need a checkup from the neck up. All right? That's where the problem is. It's how you think. It's the arena. See, Satan always tries to pull us into the arena of reason. And you will lose every time. You are not master in the arena of reason. You are master in the arena of faith. Amen? What do you mean the arena of reason? You're trying to figure it out. How's God going to do it? How can God fix this? It's such a big problem. There's no way out. See, yet you're reasoning out. Your, your mind is, is analyzing the circumstances to the degree that you can't, you can't figure out. How, and you're trying to figure out how to fix it. Nee. We need a big X up there, like one of those game shows. Nee. You lose. When Satan pulls you into the arena of reason, he is master there. Faith is not of the head, it's of the heart. Faith is not a mental exercise, it is a heart force. Remember Jesus said in Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things he saith shall come to pass, he'll have what? Whatsoever he saith. Whosoever gets whatsoever if the faith is coming out of his heart. And if it's not of your heart, it's not faith. Kenyon calls it mental assent. In other words, you mentally reason, okay, this is, you know, this makes sense. And so you mentally assent or mentally agree with it with your mind. That's not faith. Because your, your mind's squirrely. Somebody will come along with a different argument and change your mind next week. Amen. That's what the Bible says, be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Why? Because, see, if you're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, you're not ever receiving it in your heart. And you're taking it with your head and going, oh, that makes sense. Then somebody else comes along and says, oh, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, but that makes sense. Oh, but that makes sense. You're losing. You're losing. Faith is not of the heart, of the head, it's of the heart. Faith does not, it's not birthed in the heart. It's birthed in, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm getting, Faith is birthed in the heart and not in the head. And then Jesus said in verse 20, uh, 24, he said, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. Now the interesting thing is that word desire there is the same Greek word for lust. This translated lust in other places. And it means strong desire. Now we understand in context, lust, you know, ungodly lust, lusting after uh, ungodly things is wrong, it's sinful. But here this Greek word desire would mean a strong desire or lust. What things shall you strongly desire when you pray? Now understand this. Faith begins where? Where the will of God is known. Isn't that right? Faith begins where the will of God is known. And if faith begins where the will of God is known, then faith begins with the word of God. Because God's word is God's will. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Amen. If it's not birthed out of the word or by the Holy Spirit speaking to you in line with the word. Amen. The Holy Spirit's not going to tell you you got somebody else's wife. That's not, that's not the voice of God. Not the God with the big G. Now you might get the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub, telling you you're going to get somebody else's wife, but not the Father. Amen. Y'all here, you're going home. How many are still here? Well, three people don't know it. Anyway, well, we'll, we'll figure it out by the end of the service. You'll still, be, you'll still figure out you're here. All right? Hallelujah. So the word-ruled mind always agrees with God, God and his, his word, if his, word, his mind is ruled by the word, that will set you free. So therefore I say unto you, what things serve ye? Desire. Strong desire birthed out of agreement with the word of God. Amen. 
You see, well, I got a scripture that says he that desires a wife desires a good thing, and I desire her for my wife. Yeah, but the Bible also says he that looks on his neighbor's wife to lust after her hath committed adultery in his heart. You got to take the whole counsel of the whole word of God. Yeah, God wants to get you a wife, men, and God wants you to get you a husband, women, but you can't have somebody else's. One, guy, one kid came up to Dad Hagen when you actually it was when I was out there. Got it, Brother Hagen, the, the board had bought him a Ford Bronco. Now, it's one of the old, old big ones. I mean, the, the, you know, big old short. They had short bodies, big. He, he brother, he walked by his dad, was getting out of his uh, Bronco in the morning, and this rain was still. They can be so dumb. These three aren't like that, and that one back there is not like that. All right? We got four in here right now. Four, well, four excluding uh, me. It's sitting in here. That, that, you know, Greg, Jeff was a few years ago. The kids just all graduated here this, a, couple, a month ago. And uh, they, weren't, they weren't like this. They were smart. But you can have some dumb ones. And this kid walks by dad and goes, take care of my Ford Bronco. Dad said, what are you talking about? He said, the Bible says I can have what I say, and I believe that I received that Ford Bronco. And dad looked at him and said, well, I've got something to do with it. Now, well, you know, in, in, with Mark 11, 23, it says, that, what are things ever I desire when I pray? 24, when I just pray, I can have, believe I received it and I can have it. And I prayed and I believed I received it. He said, yeah, but I've already got a word from the Lord. He told me to keep it. Now, the God don't mind you having a vehicle, but you can't go and start believing for somebody else's. Hello? And that's why you're doing it. You believe for them to get one better. Well, get him a new form. Oh, I believe that. Get him a new form. What well, about just go ahead and believe for the one you got? Amen. That went over big. What we're trying to say is stay, stay with the word. I said stay with the word. Let your faith be birthed out of the word, not out of, out of flesh. And if it's, a, if it's a biblical desire, then you can believe that you, what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Okay? All right. So, the, you know, that, that kind of faith works. It gets us done. Uh, we're to walk in Abraham's faith. Uh, 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 we're to cast down reason. Reason will rob you. Well, the Bible says I can, I believe that I receive my, my financial need met in Jesus' name. And then we start going, how's he going to do it? How's he going to do it? How's he going to do it? Well, you've got to stop wringing your hands asking how he's going to do it and just believe he's going to do it. He said, if you, what, what things shall you desire when you, verse 24, Mark 11, what things soever you desire. How many have a strong desire? How many have a desire to be financially free? Desire to be healed. Desire to walk in blessing. What are you praying about? Now, here's the interesting thing. We, 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 we pray, a lot of times we get kind of weird about prayer. We come up with this idea that prayer is, we kind of get somewhere and we go, my God. I come to you by your spirit. <laughs> and we get real weird. And God the Father is looking over at Jesus the Son saying, what are they doing? Because I just heard them five minutes ago say, hey, uh, hey, dog, what's up? To his friend. He gets in there and starts talking to me. Oh, God. See, prayer is communicating with God. You talk to God. Now, listen, you understand what I'm saying. You don't go, go call God dog or homie or anything like that. I understand that. There's, there's respect. You know, my children don't call me dog or homie. You, got, you understand? I, I understand? I'm talking about, I understand the respect part. But the weird part, we don't need. Amen. When you go talk to your boss, you don't go, oh, boss. You make a Mr. So-and-so, you give him respect, but you don't get weird. Does that make sense? So, <clears throat> prayer is communicating with God. And that's born, born out in this passage. It says, therefore, what things are you desire when you pray? The word, word pray, I, I've off my notes. We'll just get somewhere. Is that all right? All right. When you pray, the Greek word pray is ateo, A-I-T-E-O. It is the same word used over in James, I believe the fourth chapter, where it says you have not because you ask not or you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. The word ask in that passage, I, I think James 4, 6, something like that. <clears throat> the word ask 
is atio. The same word translated pray here. So really we could say, you know, so it's not this thing of getting into prayer. It's what things should we desire when you ask for them. When you say, Father, I have need of, and I, and what? Believe you receive them. When, listen to this, when do you believe you got it? Now come on now, that's what we, we all need. I think under the pressure that everybody's been under the past four or five years financially in this nation, with, with, the, with the housing market falling apart, with the gas prices out the wazoos, I mean, all the stuff that people are dealing with financially. I haven't even noticed the prices of all food has gone up. I mean, the other day, we, we, were, we came in to work. We went by, uh, I went by and picked up breakfast for all six of us at Bojangles. Now, we're just talking a biscuit and, some, and, and didn't even buy individual drinks, bought half gallons because it's, che it's way cheaper to do that and just got cups of ice from them. Now, five or six years ago, I could have done that breakfast for $13. Easy. $20. $5. I mean, you're sitting there going, ha, ba, 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 and you won't speak it in tongues. You're thinking, there's, you know, you got, you got, steaks on sale are $6.99 a pound. On sale. Everybody's talking about how low the gas prices are at $3.29 a gallon. We got the Tulsa to pick the girls up, and while we were there, gas prices went up from three twenty nine a gallon to three ninety nine a gallon in four days. It's week right before Memorial Day. Seventy cents a gallon in four days. People have been under pressure. People have been under a, 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 a grinding, constant pressure financially. And let me tell you, it's, it's affecting people. And we've got to get back to doing the faith thing. You understand what I'm saying? We've got to realize that faith will work at $3.99 just like it will work at $99. We have got to go back to fulfilling the principles of the Word of God and understanding that what things ever you desire, that you're not going to believe you receive it once you get it. You believe you receive it before you ever see it. That is, listen, and I'm going to tell you something. With the pressure that's on people right now, that's not, easy. That's not an easy task. It's easier to preach this when all the money's just flowing and the stock market's going crazy and gas is cheap and food is cheap and there's real no pressure, but pressure has come. You know, the only way to fight back, we, there's no way in the natural to fight back and win. We're going to have to fight back in the Spirit. We're going to have to fight back by the power of the Holy Ghost through His Word. Amen? If we're, we as a church are going to make it, if we as a people, individuals in the church are going to make it, we got to get back to what those so ever things we desire, when we ask or pray for it, we believe we receive it. And don't ring. I want to tell, can I be honest with you? I've had times in the past few years I've been ringing. Laying down in bed at night, and I'm telling you, a devil walk in the room and get on the bed and slap you. I mean, not even just like kind of visit you, get up there and grab you around the neck and start slapping you. <laughs> You're going under. And you almost want to go, yes, 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 I am, you know. <coughs> but we can't. Because I'm the head and not the tail. Amen. I'm above only and not beneath. Amen. Glory to God. I'm blessed when I came in. And I'm blessed when I go out. Hallelujah. I'm blessed in everything I set my hand to. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you something. When you get slapped upside the head, that ain't the first thought. Are you here? Are you, uh, listen, it's a good fight of faith. It's a good fight. Listen, now, this is an extended bout. What do you mean extended bout? Usually most bouts are, 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 you know, depending on what kind of fight it is, three, nine, 12 rounds. This is round to you win. God will just keep adding on another round and keep adding on another round and keep on adding on another round. What? Until you get it. Don't be a dummy. My parents always tell me, my dad, every time we get ready to leave their house, they go, watch out for the dummies. And then his next statement is this, and don't be one. <laughs> watch out for the dummies, and don't be one. And I say, my, look, I'll keep it under 100. I promise not to have both hands off the wheel more than three or four seconds to finish my text message. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, we have got to understand that the Word of God says, Jesus said, have faith in God. Have the God kind of faith that we're to believe out of our heart and say it with our mouth. And that what things soever we desire, whatever we want, whatever we long for. And I'm telling you, I know right here in this church, I guarantee you there are people who want to be debt-free and financially free and free from the pressure of finances that are, that are crushing. Amen. 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 We've got to go back. Now, I didn't say stay home and don't work. You know, quit your job. God, I'm under grace. God's going to take care of me. No, that's under dum-dum. That's, that's, that's called radical stupidity. Come on, guys, like that. Rad radical dum-dum. You know, if you go, well, I'm in the radical grace. No, you're in the radical dum-dum. That's not what the Bible said. Are you here? <clears throat> but we have got to get back to where we're looking at the circumstances, and we're not crumbling under them. We are coming at them and, the, and saying, just like David. Remember that, remember that remember Goliath? Goliath came to me and said, who, is, who am I that you would send out this ruddy youth against me? I will feed, listen, he said this. He said, I'll feed your carcass to the fowls of the air this day. That's what Goliath said to David. And David took up the sling and the stone, and he began to charge Goliath. I mean, he's a, whoo, whoo, can you, he's just like Emma Lee. Emma Lee, he's, a, whoo, whoo, whoo. he's running at him, and he says, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts of Israel. Glory to God. He said, this day I will feed your carcass to the fowls of the air. And he let that stone go and it I mean, took him right out. <clears throat> Lucky shot. Nope. David wasn't sure. He had four extra stones. Goliath had four brothers. Amen. Read your Bible. He had four brothers. David didn't carry five stones in case he missed four times. He was prepared to take them all out that day. I mean, the, the, the heritage of Goth was going out that day. Going to take him down. Then he got so excited about the celebration, he forgot. Then it took him the rest of his life to get that. But he ended up killing all four of the other giants. One of them was six fingers. He got me, don't have a name, just a six finger giant. I'm looking for the six figured man. <laughs> 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 okay, you got to be a princess, that, that princess bride fan to hear, understand that one. You were the six fingered man. All right. Prepared to die. All right. How many have ever seen the Princess Bride? Okay, how many have never seen it? Don't. You'll actually start to like it after a while and you wonder what's wrong with you. All right. I remember the first time I saw it, I went, that's the dumbest thing ever put in the film. And now I like it. And I'm, I'm going, what, what's happened to me? I've morphed. But David came out. Goliath said, I'm gonna, the devil will tell you, I'm taking you down. I'm going I'm, I'm to destroy you. But you just stand up and say, you come to me with all your garbage, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Glory to God. This day you will be defeated in this arena in my life. Glory to God. I will not be defeated. I will not quit. Glory to God. I am, going to be, I, I am a winner. I have the faith that overcomes the world. Hallelujah. And <laughs> you're going to have to start looking at them bills. You've been looking at them, but you're going to have to look at them different. See, you've been looking at them, they've been talking to you. You're going down, dude. And you're going to have to still start looking at them and say, I am a child of the Most High God. And if I'm Christ, then I'm Abraham's seed. And I'm an heir according to the promise thereof. And the blessing of Abraham is this. In blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thee. Gwema says this. I will bless thee and bless thee and increase thee and increase thee. So the blessing of Abraham, according to Wayman's translation, is the blessing of increase and multiplied blessing. Amen. And you're just going to start looking. When them bills start talking, you're going to talk back. Or my family will think I'm crazy sitting there talking to my, my computer screen or the stack of mail or whatever. Tell them to shut up. I'm dealing with devils. I'm dealing with the U.S. Bank devil, the Chase devil, the Office Depot devil, 
Hello, the Duke Power Devil. That's definitely a blue devil, do devils. <laughs> Just couldn't help but jab that one in there. You have to start talking. You have to start saying, Father, I desire debt free. Now listen, let me, let me say this. Don't you go looking for some preacher to throw your money in his coat pocket. And by buying this, I got to give up to get blessed teaching that's not biblical. A lot of preachers, and a lot of people that I like taught it. But it's not Bible. God said for you to get your back end up and haul your tithe and offering to the storehouse. Didn't say to some preacher's coat pocket. I know I'm getting, kind of getting that. Well, we, we Western this week. Right on the end. Hallelujah. Bring, bring ye the tithe and the offering to the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. I like Malachi. He's the Italian prophet. I know it's Malachi, but I call it Malachi, the first Italian prophet. All right? He says, yeah, one, one thing he says there, he says, wherein have you, he says, you've robbed me. See, we've got people sending their money all over the place and never taking it to their church. And God said, bring it to the church. Yeah, but I'm, I'm partners with so-and-so on a monthly basis, not until you've brought your tithe and offering to the church. Now, what you do after that's your business, but the other part, God said, do this with it. Come on now. Yeah, I watch Christian television. Everybody asks for money. I send it to them. I just don't have any left over from my church. You're, you're missing God. God said, you robbed me and even this whole nation. How? In tithe and offering. Bring ye the tithe into the storehouse and prove me now herewith. And see if I ought to open up to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I love my margin. The margin of my Bible says this, where it says pour you out a blessing. It says empty out. God says if you'll tithe, and bring offerings to your church. That's the storehouse. It was the temple in the Old Testament. The church is the new temple, so to speak. We can't, we can't get too, too caught up in allegories because you get, you'll get an error. <clears throat> I knew one guy that all the tithe of the church, he got it because he was the priest. And then he took up an offering to cover the expenses of the building. I'm like, well, that, 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 we don't see that in the New Testament. This is the tithe This goes to me because I'm the priest. Now, we might not have any air conditioner, or heat lights or heat in here, but I'd have a nice house. Be living good. All the tithe come to me. We don't do that. All right? That's not how it works in the New Testament. But God said, bring the tithe and offering to the storehouse, and I'll open up and I will pour you out or empty out on you. Now, see, and listen, he's not even opened up a window of heaven. He's opened up the windows of heaven. The windows of heaven are open. Blessings are flowing in the night. There is joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave you my old tattered garments, gave me a robe of your white, feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy tonight. I tell you what, you start bringing the tithe and offering, and God start opening up the windows and pouring out on you blessings you can't remember to receive, you'll have joy. Amen. You'll have some joy. I'm talking, I'm, you, know, you start walking in the blessings of God, there's joy. Can you say amen? amen. But God said, I will pour out or empty out on you blessings you can't have room enough to receive. Why? Because you did what he said to do. <clears throat> you put your confidence in him. I, people sometimes say, I can't, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. Why? Because the minute you stop, you shut the windows. And God says you're a thief. Who wants to be a thief? Any, any thieves in here? Anybody want to be a thief? Well, I just think I can give God whatever I want to give when I want to give it to him. That's all right. That's not all right. That's not how God operates. God has set it up and said, you bring 10%, and that's it. And you want to give more, and you want to give a special offering, bring the special. But that 10% is mine, whether you like it or not. Because it's my financial plan to take care of my work, take care of my ministers, and to open up an avenue of blessing into your life. 
God wants to bless your life. So, let me say this, and I'm going to jump back into my notes here. If you will go um, to James, the second chapter. And actually, I'm, I'm going to, I'm actually going to leave my notes. I don't even have this in my notes. But James chapter 2, and I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. Um, we don't have that. We haven't, we, well, since we rebuilt, we've got to buy the, new ver- we got to buy the uh, license again. Hallelujah. James chapter 2, verse 14. What is the use or profit, my brother, for anyone to profess they have faith if he has no good works to show for it? Can such faith save his soul? If a brother or sister is poorly clad and lacks food each for each day, and one of you says to him, goodbye, keep yourself warm and well-fed without giving him the necessities for the body, what good does that do? So also faith, if it does not have works, that is, deeds, actions of obedience to back it up, That'll mess up a gracious message. By itself is destitute of power, inoperative or dead. But someone will say to you then, you say you have faith and I have good works. Now show me your alleged faith apart from any good works if you can. And I by good works of obedience will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. So do the demons believe in shudder and terror and horror. Uh, <clears throat> and makes a man's hair stand on the end and contracts the surface of the skin. Are you willing to be shown proof, you foolish, unproductive, spiritually deficient fellow, that faith apart from good works is inactive and ineffective, ineffective and worthless? And he goes on to talk about how Abraham was justified by his works and not by his faith alone. When, when Abraham offered up Isaac, it was accounted to him for righteousness. In other words, the works of his faith, the actions that are a result of faith. That's what he's talking about, these works here. <clears throat> well, Paul says, you know, that, that we're not justified by works. Talk about two different things. You've got to be a little bit better student of the Bible. And I'm talking to people who go around and teach this. You know, Paul said that we're not justified, I mean, that, that, that works, that we're not justified by faith, that if we go back into works, we're, we're foolish and so forth. James tells us we're justified by our works. We're not talking about two different things. <clears throat> if you will read Paul in context, he's making a reference to fulfilling the Levitical law in order to obtain righteousness. You cannot. It, when Paul refers to works, he is talking about the works of the law to obtain a standing with God. You can't do it. James, on the other hand, is referring to the fact that your faith has already saved you and that the faith you have will produce actions that correspond and demonstrate the faith you have. Now, if we go over to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hello. Hebrews 11. It says here, um, let, me get out of, let me get back to King James. It's easier to read this than King James. Okay. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, through faith, we understand the world were famed. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch was translated. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, moved. By faith, Abraham, when he was called out, went. By faith, he sojourned. He looked for a city. Through faith, also Sarah received. Therefore, spring, no, 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 these all died in faith. Hallelujah. And, and, and by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Um, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of Israel concerning his bones. By faith, when Moses was born, his parents hid him. By faith, uh, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called. Um, let's see. By faith, he forsook Egypt. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the harlot, per, uh, harlot Rahab perished not. And what more shall I say? For the time when it would tell me of uh, Gideon and Barak and of Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samson and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant and fight, turned to fly the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, 
<coughs> not, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better uh, resurrection. Others had cruel mockings and scourges, yea, more of a bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn and sundered, tempted, slain, wandered, of whom the world was not worthy, and all these obtaining a good report through faith, and have received not the promise of redemption. But let me say this. Here, here. Did you notice about everything it said through faith something happened? There was an act, there was some kind of action that followed through faith or by faith. Not one time did it say, by faith, they laid down and just sat under the grace of God and looked at the finished work of Jesus. Now, did it? You're mocking the, no, I'm not mocking the finished work of Jesus. I'm talking about people who've misinterpreted the finished work of Jesus. Faith does not put you on the couch and go, well, it don't matter what I do today if I sin or if I don't sin. It don't matter if I give or don't give. The blessings are going to come on me. I'm going to prosper no matter what because Jesus did it. I'm going to get this no matter what because Jesus did it. And the Bible's examples of faith, every one of them, they did something in response to the faith they had. It drove them into, their faith drove them into acts of obedience to receive. Now, our faith, <coughs> our faith in the Word of God should drive us to obey the word of God. If you're, let me say this. You can speak to your bills, but if you don't do what the Bible says about tithing and giving, your speaking is, is powerless. Speaking, when the Bible tells you to do something, and you're, oh, I'm going to do well, uh, I'm blessed, I'm under grace, I'm going to get it, I believe that I receive, and you just sit down and do nothing, it doesn't work that way. When the Bible gives instructions, you have to obey. Now, we all desire to be financially free, right? Isn't that right? Well, yeah, Pastor Ed, but you know what? I'm under grace. I'm going to get blessed financially no matter what I do. Uh, yeah. Keep believing that if you want to. We'll come by and visit where you're, you're in the poe house. Amen. Y'all here, you gone home. Y'all are exciting. Hallelujah. I'm trying to find something here. Can y'all just hold on with me for this minute? All right. Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and you look at chapter 8, more of a brother than we do, we do you. I, I don't know why I'm over here, but God's listening. Listen, we're, I know there's a financial attack. I, and listen, whether you like the president, don't like the president, and don't, or just don't care who's president, if you don't care who the, the party is, if you don't care about the politics of everything, you just don't care, or you can't stand one party, and you love another party. Let me say something. That's all irrelevant to faith. Now, as a citizen, a godly citizen, you're, you, are to, you are to vote and to do things righteously, and then things fall as they fall. But you have a responsibility to follow after righteousness. Amen? And there are, you know, without getting into a whole lot of politics, there are scriptures that say that people rejoice when the righteous rule. There's things we need to understand. But beyond that, you, got, you can't get going, well, well, we got this party running the country, and they're about to ruin it. I remember, back, I remember when Reagan came into office, but my, my, my father-in-law's neighbor, we're well, going back to Hoover days. Going to have bread lines. That's because the, they thought the Republicans were going to put us in bread lines. That was, you know, and actually, if you go back and study, it wasn't Hoover, it wasn't Hoover anyway. It was, it was Coolidge days. Hoover just got into presidency by the time it all hit. Isn't that right, Mr. C? Yep, that's right. All right, all right. Moreover, brethren, we, we do you to know the grace of God bestowed in the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto, uh, unto the riches of their liberality. The grace he's talking about here is not undeserved, unmerited favor. It's talking about money. And although I know you can take the, 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 the word, go, well, that means unmerited, undeserved favor. But if we study it in context, the word carries, they're talking about money. This grace was, was giving. It was giving grace. Amen. For to their power I bear record, yea, beyond their power they were willing of themselves. In other words, they, were, they, they gave even beyond what they could give. 
And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave to our, their selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God, insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would finish also in you the same grace also. Talking about given. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence and in your love, see that you abound in this grace. Not talking about grace, undeserved, unmerited favor. It's talking about this giving. Also, speak not by commandment, by occasion, the forwardness of others, to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. Now, we're going to jump over to chapter 9. And the reason I am, because he I just wanted to show you what he's talking about in chapter 8. He is talking about this. He does not stop when he gets to chapter 9. He goes on. Now, as far as touching the ministry of saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast to, of, of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and that your zeal has provoked very many. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I have said, you may be ready. Lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me. In fact, remember, he was over in Macedonia talking about what? The grace they had of giving. If, they, if those folks come with him to this group, you should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. It's a gift of money. Whereof you had noticed before the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. A gift. This, now, let me say something here. If you believe that you're under grace and that you're going to get money no matter what you do, Stop listening. Because I'm going to mess up your theology with this one verse. And if you don't want to hear, if you don't want to hear the Word of God, and you don't want to be tra transformed by the Word of God, and you don't want the Word of God to change you and be the sole foundation of your life, stop listening, because I'm going to mess up your theology. But this I say, but talk about money for two chapters now. He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to the grace of God. Come on now, you're supposed to call it that. Every man according as he purposes in his own heart. Let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to also, uh, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always have an all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now let me say something here. You can't run in there and take verse 8 out and run off with it. Because verse 8 followed verse 6 and 7, and the word and is there. It's tied to the other. It is a conjunction. And is a conjunction. It ties thoughts together he didn't start another you know, a little little editor am i right you sow sparingly you reap sparingly according as you purpose in your heart and in other words in response to how you purpose how you sow god has been able, able to make all grace abound toward you that you always have an all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work that does not stand independent of those other scriptures and this is where people um, data mine the Bible to find scriptures that support their doctrine and take them out of context. You can't do that. If you're going to have a faith that changes things, it's going to have to be on the counsel of the Word of God. Now, here, what I'm after is this, and then he goes on and says this, uh, <coughs> as it is written, see, understand, as, as it is written, this is, is in brackets here. The reason is, it is a sub-thought to the statement just made. In other words, you could jump over that and go, being enriched in all bountifulness, which calls us to us thanksgiving to God. But he jumped in there and put a side thought. In other words, uh, he kind of went like this, being sufficient in all things. Now let me say this in relation to that. That's really what this is meaning by the, by the punctuation marks. And, and I need to tell you this, in relation to that, as it is written, he that is first abroad hath given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever, now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Let me say something. The grace of God here is not that you're going to prosper. And I'm talking about the undeserved, unmerited favor, the grace that you're going to prosper. The grace of God here is not that you're going to prosper no matter what you do. The grace of God here is this. He's ministered seed to the sower. 
And he'll give you bread to eat and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of what? The grace is not that you get blessed no matter what you do. The grace is he makes the provision for you to act in faith. Now, he says, when you plant the seed, I'll take care of you until harvest comes in. That's what bread for your food is. He that ministers seed to the sower, both, uh, wait, wait, right? See, both ministers bread for your food and multiplies the seed sown. That's what he's saying here is this. God's grace, radical grace, you didn't deserve to get the seed, but God gave you the seed anyway. God gave you the seed. And this, here's how good he is. When you go plant the seed, how many know you don't get an instant harvest? Come on now. Now, we got, now the rabbits hadn't got my collars, Mr. C. The bugs got them. We seven dusted them the other day because the bugs were eating them up. We got some beans growing, got some squash growing, got some melon growing, watermelon, glory to God. Can't wait to get me some watermelon, put it in ice, a, a, a chest of ice, throw some rocks on it, and get that, that rascal cold. Crack it open and slobber all over the deck. Sunday. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. You don't get in this. It took, it took weeks. We planted some grass seed. I, I, I don't know about you, fescue takes forever. That's the slowest growing slow grass I've ever seen. You plant the seed, you do not get an instant harvest. What do you get? First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. It's a process. God knows that. I said God knows that. And this is where people get in trouble. They misinterpret <coughs> giving seed and bread for food. They misinterpret that. As the harvest. God gives you seed to sow. He gives seed to who? Now, if you're a sower, what are you doing? I'm laying down and working at the finished work of Jesus. No! You're not going to get a harvest if, you go, if somebody brings by a bag of seed. Now, now Miss Geraldine found out we had cab cabbage collars. That's the Eastern Carolina thing. And we carried her some seeds. And I asked her about them. She already had them in her hot house and growing. Well, she's a sower. I said, she's a sower. We gave her seed. Now, I could have called her up and said, Miss Geraldine, how are them cabbage collars going? Well, I, you know, they're still in the bag. I'm waiting for them. They're, I'm going to have me some collars this fall because I got the seed. No, 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 no. Until you sow the seed, you can't get a harvest. We got people misinterpreting the bread for food as the harvest of a seed sown and calling it radical grace. Hello? Totally misinterpreting and not understanding the Scripture. The Scripture says he gives seed to the sower. And he also ministers you to you bread for your food and multiplies the seed sown. Why? God created the whole seed time and harvest thing, and he knows that if I just give you seed to sow, you're going to starve before the harvest comes in. So here's his deal. His grace is, I'm going to provide the seed, and I'll feed you until you get your harvest. Amen. But you've got to sow the seed. Because if you don't sow the seed, you're going to run out of the bread for food because that was a temporary blessing until you got harvest. You all hear you're going home. That's how it works. And you got people running around teaching churches and teaching people that you just lay down and let the seed sit on the sideline and eat the bread for food and teach everybody that it's their harvest of grace. And that's not Bible. History, uh, history tells us that Jews, <coughs> when they were traveling, they would go out and take seed and throw it on the river during the flood season. And then when the river subsided, that seed was left in that, that real fertile silt. 
And when they arrived, by the time they got there, they had a harvest waiting on them. They were casting their bread on the water. Are you here? They were making provision for the future. And when you start eating your bread as your harvest and letting your seed sit on the sideline, you're going to run out. And you think, oh, look how God blessed me. Hallelujah, I'm a faith man. I just got blessed. No, 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 you don't understand. There was a grace on your finances where God gave you seed to sow. We always say this, don't eat your seed. Don't go make rye bread out of your Bible, faith seed. Are you here? God's going to sustain you until your harvest comes in. But if you didn't plant, and it's harvest time, and your bread runs out, you're in trouble. Because now you've got to go plant, and you don't have anything to eat while you're waiting for harvest to show up. Don't misinterpret something. But you see, people just run out there, and they, they want to build stuff, and, and they, they want to give a testimony. Oh, look what happened. I did this. You know, I just got saved, and, asked, and, and I'm resting, and I just got, you know, I got a $100 gift. Woo, I get blessed no matter what I do. No, 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 bozo. You're eating, the, you're eating the grace provision of a season. Get your seed in the ground. Now, this is, I'm talking about money right now, but let me tell you something. This works in all areas of life. We've got to stop eating the provision where God sustains us through a season and we're not planting the seed for the future harvest. We've got to start planting our harvest, our faith harvest. We've got to start speaking the seed of life over our finances, over our bodies. Gifts to the Spirit a lot of time are bread for your food. You get an instant miracle or healing. But you've got to plant the harvest of health by believing God and studying the Word. Remember, Dad, I'm, I'm going to close right here, all right? Dad Hagen talked about how that. He used to go in had, during the healing revival. He'd go into churches and pray for the sick, and people get instantly healed. I mean, miracle signs went. Come back to the same church a year later, and 80% of the people he prayed for had lost their healing. What? They got bread for food. The gift of the Spirit provided a relief, temporary injunction, as it were, against what they had received, what they needed. But he found out they needed teaching to keep what they got. They needed the seed of faith planted to hold on to what God had given them a temporary relief from in so many cases. 80%. 80%. Well, if they had anything, they would have kept it. Well, listen, I had I, you say, <coughs> a number of years ago, we were, <coughs> um, Al and I were over and doing some work here at the church. It may have been the day we did the Daryl and Daryl thing. I'm not sure. But this lady called one of our bookstores up and she came in. Anybody ever heard the Daryl and Daryl story? All right. Yeah, we'll tell another day. Some of you just have to wonder. How many have never heard the Daryl and Daryl story? All right, real quick. We had a circuit next door. That something kept wasn't working right. And, and, and instead of going out and buying a tester, I thought, ah, oh, I got this fixed. And because all the breakers were on, they were working, you know, they were all in the right position. So I took a piece of, like, number uh, 12 wire, skinned both ends, and it was long enough that I could reach around on one side of a breaker and hit the other side of the breaker. And I was going to go down to the breakers until the power started working. I said, oh, okay, we, we looped around it. I know which breaker it is to replace. That may have worked. Now, let me say this. Don't ever, it's like one of those commercials at the bottom says, professional, don't try this. My commercial will say, idiot, don't try this. <laughs> so we're back in this little storage room over here in this other building, way down there in the corner, and Alan's right over my shoulder with the flashlight. <laughs> and I reach in there, and like a dummy, I didn't go around one circuit. I cross-faced two circuits. On the hot side. And it went kapow! And I jumped back. I knocked him down. My fingers had smoke on. Smoke hit me in the face. So we started going around and introducing ourselves. Hello, I'm Daryl. This is my brother Daryl. We're Daryl and Daryl Electric Company. <laughs> you remember the Bob Duhart show? Larry and Daryl and Daryl. <laughs> Daryl and Daryl Electric Company. Dumb. But you know, here's, here's the funny thing it fixed it. <laughs> Whatever was wrong, we, have, we haven't messed with it since. It still works. <laughs> now that's called grace on stupidity. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, my, 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 my. Hallelujah. Daryl was over here the other day that came to vacation Bible school. Daryl and Daryl Ledger. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Where was I? Lady Bush. Has Lady call us up? You know, and she, and, and she, she was bringing a friend that came in. And the woman was talking, you know, I, 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 you know how deaf people talk? Well, she was talking to us. She said a, few, a couple years earlier she had been to a service and instantly healed, heard perfectly for a week. Woke up one morning and it was gone. Don't tell me things like that don't happen. What was the problem? Everybody's depending on the gift, the bread for food, instead of sowing the seed. Thank God for the bread for food to sustain you until you can get the harvest to, to, to live off of. The seed to sow is to be sown for your livelihood to live off of. In any arena, health, finances, whatever, that seed sown is to be where you live from. The bread for food is to sustain you till you get the harvest. So the gifts, gifts of the Spirit many times are like bread for food. They can hold you until you get into the Word and get, because a lot of times people aren't in a place to get a hold of the Word. They're in such pain or whatever, they need to get a hold, they need a relief so they can get into the Word. Let me say this, if you get supernaturally healed by God, you better get in the Word. Because it reminds me of the story that Dad used to tell about the woman that came to him one day, the man came to him one day and said, well, um, you don't have it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I've been in your healing line twice, and, and you've laid hands on me, and I, had, I, and I hadn't got healed. Then he says, now, uh, Sybil McPherson used to have it, but she lost it. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, a number of years ago, I was, a, I was, I was, I was dealing with this, and, and I went to, went to Amy Sybil McPherson's meeting, and she laid hands on me, and I got healed. A few months later, I lost it, so I went back to her meeting. She laid hands on me. I didn't get it. So she had it, but she lost it. Then I went over to Jack Coe's meeting. He didn't have it. Now, McPherson had it, but she lost it. And after that, I went over to Brandon's meeting. He prayed for me. Now, Brandon didn't have it. Coe didn't have it. Now, McPherson had it, but she lost it. I went over to Oral Roberts. He laid hands on me. Roberts don't have it. Coe don't have it. Brandon don't have it. Now, McPherson had it, but she lost it. And he goes, he says, and he goes through all the healing evangelists. He'd been to all of them. Went over uh, Raymond T. Ritchie's meeting. Ritchie didn't have it. Roberts didn't have it. Coe didn't have it. Branham didn't have it. McPherson had it, but she lost it. She said, no, nah, I've been in your line. You don't have it. Goes up that whole thing. He said, oh, I can help you. He said, the first time you got it was a, was a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. The second time, God expected you to get it on your own faith. He said, do you come to the morning service and let me hear me teach? And he can teach it on faith. He had, remember, remember, Dad Hagen went and started having uh, healing crusades at night. Camp meetings at night, but in the morning he taught on faith. He said, you come hear me teach. You come at least for a certain number of days to the meetings and hear me teach on faith. man came to the healing line at sometime one or, one or two weeks later or whatever. Came up to him and says, I got it. He says, you lay hands on me, I'll receive my healing right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I understand what you're talking about. But see, the first time was, let me, let me use the, 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 uh, the allegory I'm using here from this morning from this passage. The first time he fiercely laid hands on was bread for his food. Everything else, God was expecting him to sow seed to get a harvest, to live out of faith in the word of God and not a dependency on somebody providing you bread for food all the time. Can you say amen? I don't think there's anything wrong with the government helping people with bread for food until they sow their seed and live off the harvest. Now, when you've got three generations living off the bread for food, it's going to run out. People need to learn. It's all, you can you apply this anywhere. <coughs> and I believe that's right. And I believe biblically, spiritually, and natural things, and things in the Word of God. We have got to be planting our seed. Well, how do I plant my seed for, for money? When I say it's time to tithe, you ought to be going, Woo! Glory to God! It's seed sowing time! Glory to God. Hallelujah. And don't get so dumb because you got some money in the bank and you're not sowing seed. Well, I'm blessed and I don't have and I have been given. It's bread for food. It's temporary. It's a temporary grace. Because when he gave you the bread for food, he gave you seed to sow. Let's go pick, let's go pick up my Bible. My electronic Bible. See, I got scriptures up there. All right, see? 
All right. Take and sow the seed again. Go back to sowing seed. Go back to talking to your problems. Not talking about them and not letting them talk to you. You talk to them. Be like Jesus when he came in contact with the demon-possessed man. And now, King James says it real sweet. Hold thy peace. I just don't imagine that Jesus really stood around and went, hold thy peace. Because hold thy peace is King Jimmy for Shut up! <laughs> Hello? The Brits are always so proper. Have you ever watched them in Parliament argue? Hello? Well, the, the gentleman is right. I do not agree with the gentleman. We will schedule a meeting afterwards to talk about it. <laughs> Give me a break. You buzzer, you don't have a clue what you're talking about over there. That's how you talk to them. Devils, shut up. Bills, shut up. Stop talking to me. I'm talking to you. I'm telling you, you are paid off in Jesus' name. How are they going to get paid off? Stop trying to reason out how your faith is going to get it done. But start talking. Bible. And sow your seed. Come on now, sow your seed. Stop, stop letting everything talk to you. Stop letting your body talk to you. Stop letting your body say, I'm, you got cancer, I'm going to kill you. Say, shut up! I'm talking to you. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And I decree you healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet in Jesus' name. Now line up. Whatever, what happens, open his mouth again. Tell him to shut up. And tell him what the Bible says. It's like Carmen had that song. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. My past is ugly, but my past has been washed. It's been cleansed, and my future is settled. Hallelujah. Amen. Devil's past may have looked all right, but his future is not going to be pretty. <laughs> I did say pretty. Been Western week. <clears throat> it's going to be English bulldog ugly. <laughs> I think that's a dog that's got all the wrinkles. Yeah. Have you ever seen that dog? They're so ugly, they're cute. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That, that pastor doesn't do long. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. Y'all have a good Father's Day.